Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll tour the Charles Lindbergh Museum in Little Falls, Minnesota. But first, joining me now is the new Director of North Dakota Parks and Recreation, Melissa Baker. Melissa, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Well, tell us about yourself, your background a little bit, and where you're originally from. Okay, well, I grew up in West Tennessee, um, on the West Kentucky-Tennessee line. Um, I am from a rural and farming community, um, and I left there to go to school. So I went to school in um, West Tennessee at University of Tennessee at Martin, um, and then at Southern Illinois in Carbondale, and finally in Montana at University of Montana, which is what took me to Montana. Well, good. That's nice. We'll have to talk about that later. <laughs> I went to UT Martin. Did you uh, really? Let's, let's talk about how you got into parks and recreation. Okay. Um, well, in 2000, um, I was in college. I was a bit of a late bloomer. Um, I was in college, and I took a summer seasonal job in Columbus Belmont State Park in Columbus, Kentucky. And what I was doing in that job is I was um, managing the campground, so I was checking in visitors, cleaning facilities, um, making sure the grounds were kept, taking in money, things like that. Um, and I just really liked the job. I liked that we were taking care of an important resource for the community. I liked that we were providing good experiences for visitors and there was a sense of family in the campground um, and among the staff and that really fit. And I really liked that in recreation you're managing important places but you're managing them for people. And so you had that intersection of important resources, but then also the social side of that mm -hmm. and making them accessible for people and managing them for people. Um, so that was my first job in recreation. At the time, I was majoring in mathematics education, and that prompted a change in major for me. And so um, uh, it, that one summer job in parks changed the trajectory of my career. Wow. Well. Now, most recently, you served as Chief of Operations for Montana uh, mm -hmm. State Parks. Can you tell us about that job and sort of the responsibilities you had there? Sure. In Montana, I was Assistant Administrator and Chief of Operations. So I was responsible for managing all of the field operations of, of state parks there. So I managed five regional park managers, and I was also in charge of AmeriCorps volunteers, um, interpretation, park planning, and heritage resources. All of those programs were under my umbrella. So if it happened in a park in Montana, um, it fell within my responsibilities. Um, it was really good work. We did some work towards strategic plan. So when I got to Montana, they had already created a strategic plan. And part of what drew me to the, that job is that they had this plan in place and they were beginning implementation of that plan. And so in that job, I was very fortunate to work with really good people who wanted to look at how they did business and make sure that what they were doing was the right thing to be doing it and that we were conducting our business in the best way that we could. Um, so that was really nice, really good people to work with. The system there is 55 parks. Um, those parks range from very small parks that have a prairie dog colony or a single building to very large parks like all of the units around Flathead Lake State Park. Um, so a wide range of properties in that system, some very historic resources, um, high recreation resources. Um, so a, a range of, of experiences that you can get in those parks. Um, and being involved in that was, was really um, fulfilling. Yeah, and you also previously taught college uh, courses in these areas, I understand. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. I did. I, um, when I got my PhD, um, the normal trajectory from a PhD is often moving into um, being a professor. And since my undergraduate coursework started in teaching, that was attractive to me. Um, so I taught as an adjunct professor for one year out of my PhD program at the University of Maine. And there I taught in the Parks, Rec, and Tourism major. I taught classes in um, park management, in tourism management. Um, and after that position, I moved to the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, which is a large natural resources program um, 
mainly focused on undergraduate work, and they had an active but small recreation management program in the Division of Forestry there. Um, and I taught all of the recreation classes there. So I taught park planning, I taught park management, um, I did teach tourism where we talked about what are the businesses associated with recreation um, and how you manage those businesses or how you might um, become an entrepreneur um, for businesses like that. So we really looked at from the small businesses that recreation supports through to if you're managing a local, state, or national recreation area. Mm -hmm. but, and you also did research on park issues. I did. In, um, when I was in Illinois at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, I did a study at Giant Springs State Park. Um, and in that study, actually that was Giant City State Park, mm -hmm. um, at Giant City State Park in Southern Illinois, and my research there was dealing with place attachment. So what are the things that make places important to people? Um, that's a central concept within parks and recreation because most of the time when we have a park, um, that park was set aside because it's important to people for a variety of reasons. In some instances, that's because it offers great fishing or hiking. Um, camping. In other places, that's because it has a, an important historical or cultural um, history and resource attached to it. And so my research there was looking at why was that park important to the visitors in the community there. Um, very interesting research. Also looking at the interpretive services that were there. So when they were doing interpretation programming, um, who was coming to that and what was their level of satisfaction with that? How did they receive that programming and how could it be better? Um, when I was in Montana, I did some research at Yellowstone National Park and Glacier National Park. Um, in Yellowstone National Park, I was assisting a colleague of mine in a study of um, winter recreation use in Yellowstone and um, the impact of or the influence of snowmobiles and snow coaches on the soundscape, the natural sounds. Mm -hmm. um, in Yellowstone, it's a very different environment in the winter than it is in the summer, and sound is a big part of that because there are so many fewer people. Um, so I was very fortunate to be able to work with that group of researchers there. Um, my dissertation research was at Glacier National Park, and the work I did there was largely on communications and behavior, um, visitor behavior. So at um, Glacier National Park, they are just ending a 10-year project of reconstructing the Going to the Sun Road. And as part of that project, they knew they were going to be slowing down traffic or possibly not allowing traffic over the road. Um, that's a very important resource to the local communities. Um, it's a park where people tend to drive through the park and often will visit communities on either side of the park. And traveling that road is a central um, experience that the park offers. So that road is a national engineering landmark. Um, and have you ever been to Glacier mm -hmm. and traveled that road? It's, it's really spectacular. And a lot of people plan their vacations around that road. And so having access across that road is really important to the local communities. What my research was um, is I spent two summers there. My first summer I continued a traffic study that had already been going on, looking at how people traveled across the road and where they spent their time. Um, and the other part of my research was looking at the shuttle system. So as part of doing the, the road construction, project, they implemented a shuttle system on the, the going to the center road, knowing that they needed to leave the road open to support local communities, but that they were going to significantly affect traffic flow. They brought in shuttles. And initially, the concern was, how do we get people to ride shuttles at Glacier National Park? Um, the shuttles were so popular that I had to do a little bit of a switch in my research and how to, into how do we get the right people to ride the shuttles in Glacier National Park. Um, how do we alleviate the, the congestion in the construction zones? That's really mm -hmm. what we were looking at. Um, and so what I looked at there was why are people riding shuttles? Um, what motivates them to use the shuttle? And what would motivate them to either use the shuttle or use their car basing, 
um, based on the needs that they have for managing traffic within the park. So really interesting mix of what motivates visitors to behave the way they do and how can we communicate with them to help them have good experiences. Yeah. Well, so all of that got you to now North Dakota. So when did you start and how has the transition been so far? So I started in um, North Dakota State Parks in late April. Um, the transition has been great. Um, I knew a little bit about North Dakota before I came in and the park system here. Um, North Dakota attends a um, conference that Montana State Parks attends, which is the Rocky Mountain State Park Executive Conference. And I had met some of the staff from, from North Dakota in my um, interactions there. Um, and then also in our strategic work, we had looked at how North Dakota was doing business. Um, so North Dakota has a good reputation in the national recreation community for doing business well, for providing good experiences. So I knew a little bit of that and that was exciting. Um, and one of the motivators for me to um, look at the position and to take the position. What I've found since I've been here is that those impressions are accurate. Um, we have really high functioning staff. They're passionate about what they do. They understand the work that they do. Um, and they give above and beyond what you would expect of a paid employee um, to do the work. And that's often true in recreation um, professions. Um, people get into this line of work because they have a passion for yeah. parks and for people. Um, and that has been true in North Dakota as well. So um, getting to know the staff has been really satisfying and they're teaching me a lot. Well, so what is the role? What does the job entail as director of Parks and Recreation? Well, a lot of my time is spent on the overall big picture management of the department um, strategy, looking at um, what should be those strategic initiatives, where are those areas where we can improve, and guiding staff through the conversations of how do we want to manage the system. Um, I also have um, roles and partnerships, so I partner with other agencies that have natural resources, um, Game and Fish being an example. A lot of our parks offer great fishing opportunities, and obviously that creates situations where we're going to work closely with Game and Fish. So I'll be working with other agency leaders and looking at where can we combine efforts to create efficiencies and provide um, really good service to the people of North Dakota. How many parks does North Dakota have? North Dakota has 14 parks, um, including the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center and, and um, Fort Mandan that are, are considered together. So, and then how many employees uh, do you have? We have 66 um, FTE. Mm -hmm. And um, after the, um, the new fiscal year, we'll have 62.5 FTE. Um, so like all agencies, we're having to constrict a little bit right now. Um, that's our full-time, permanent, generally funded employees. We also, as a, an agency that um, creates revenue, um, we're able to hire additional staff seasonally that don't go into our FTE account. Um, so we have around 100 seasonal employees as well um, that work in these state parks. A lot of um, interpreters, so if you've gone to a state park and you've taken a tour um, or you've experienced some of our living history, those are our ter interpretive staff and the majority of them are seasonal. Um, also visitor services staff, people who check you in when you come in for your, your campsite. Um, people who keep the facilities clean. Um, one thing I've been happy to see so far is that we have very well-kept clean facilities. Um, we have permanent staff that do that year-round, but we have a lot of seasonal staff that come in and create the, the atmosphere that, that North Dakotans want to see and to be in when they come to their state parks. Sure. Early in your tenure, have you had a chance to go to all the state parks or do you plan to do all that? I haven't been to all of them yet, but I do plan to um, go to all of them. I have um, already gotten my camper out. So in um, late April, early May, I got out the pop-up camper and went to Lake Sakakawea State Park on a beautiful weekend that got a little windy, um, which is an uncommon up there. Um, and I plan to, to pull that little pop-up camper to as many parks as I can get it in this summer. Well, good for you. Uh, 
I understand you also will be dealing with like invasive plants uh, with part of your role. Uh, can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Though? Yeah, um, so all land management agencies have to deal with being good neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and one part of being a good neighbor is taking care of invasive plants. Um, so we do have a biologist on staff and we have seasonal staff that they are focused on taking care of non-native and invasive plants mapping where we have those issues, um, cataloging where we have those plants, and then actually going in and spraying or pulling or, and eradicating what plants we have. Um, invasive plants are an ongoing issue. Um, they don't go away. You keep them under control or you don't. Um, and so the efforts of, of these staff members keep the plants under control as much as we possibly can and reduce their ability to spread into adjacent lands, which is really important work for us. Mm -hmm. What kind of summer are you anticipating? Uh, I mean, you hadn't been in North Dakota for a summer yet, uh, but for this year, what, what what's expected? Well, our visitation has been high, mm -hmm. um, and with our campsites being um, reservable, we can already kind of see where the summer is going. And we expect that visitation will be high again this year, that our campsites will be very busy. Um, we have several um, activities and events that will be planned. You can find those on the North Dakota State Parks website. Um, and so we'll have a mix of day use and overnight recreation, lots of swimming and fishing, um, interpretive services. Um, so we expect that our, our visitation will continue to increase. Um, and that um, we'll be really busy. Mm -hmm. Now, is your department fully funded uh, through state dollars? It, no. Mm -hmm. So we have a variety of funding sources. Um, we do have state dollars in our funding. Um, we also have revenues that we generate through mm -hmm. our camping and our admission fees. Mm -hmm. um, we also manage several recreation programs. And so if you have been on an ATV trail or a snowmobile trail in this in the state, if you've been on any multi-community connecting trails, you've probably been on a trail that has been funded at least in part um, through a grant that North Dakota State Parks and Recreation manages and facilitates. We have a couple of those grants that are long-term ongoing grants that are federally funded and the um, State Parks and Recreation Department manages the grant cycles for those. Land and Water Conservation Fund is one of the funding sources for our grant programs. It's a program that communities can access to put in public parks, to put in playgrounds, fishing access sites, um, trails as well. Um, but it's a way for communities to increase their quality of living and to provide recreation experiences. Our staff um, manage those um, grants and then they also provide expertise for communities that want to do this. Um, so you can call our grant staff and, and talk about if you have an idea, if we have funding that can work with that, and how you might best um, think about planning and developing that. Another grant program we have is the Recreation Trails Grant Program. Um, and that grant funds um, recreation trails, snowmobile trails, ATV trails, bicycle trails, and hiking trails. Um, and mm -hmm. that's another grant that people can apply for. Well, I'm sorry, we're out of time. So <gasps> if people want more information, where's the best place they can go? Uh, the best place they can go is the North, North Dakota State Parks and Recreation website. Um, you can find information on all of our parks and our grant programs there. Thanks so much for joining us today. And good luck to you in your Thank new you. job. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I appreciate it. Stay tuned for more. At the Charles Lindbergh Historic Site, visitors learn more about the man known as Lucky Lindy at his boyhood home in Little Falls, Minnesota. Although Lindbergh was an intensely private person, he shared many personal stories with curators about how his early life on a farm led to his career as a flyer and surprisingly as an inventor. He was so large, so big. His flight came along right at the time with the film industry and radio. That's all you saw was that public face and he was such a private person that you wouldn't have heard about his farm life unless you knew him from here in Little Falls. The 
this is where Charles developed his ideas. This is where he saw his first airplane and was reading all those stories during the First World War about fighter pilots. And it's really where he developed his creative mechanical abilities, tinkering with the tractor and figuring out puzzles to make the farm running easier. Charles Lindbergh left the farm in 1920, went off to Madison, Wisconsin to be an engineering student. Lasted only three semesters. He left before he could flunk out, um, didn't really apply himself to his studies. After that, he convinced his father to help him enroll as an aviation student down in Nebraska, learned how to fly, spent a couple years as a barnstormer where he really refined his skills. Barnstormers, gypsy flyers, flying fools. Started off as a mechanic for the barnstorming company and uh, traded off his mechanical abilities for more flying lessons. Really honed in his skills when he joined the Army Flight School in the mid-20s. It was really there that he learned to apply himself as a student. Out of the 120 some odd students at the beginning of his course, only a dozen were left by the end and he was number one in his class. After the Army, he was hired as the chief pilot for Robertson Aircraft Company, which uh, had just uh, received the contract for the St. Louis, Missouri to Chicago, Illinois airmail route. And so that's what he spent the next year doing, is flying the airmail. And he had to fly through storms and snow and light and dark, and just really tested his limits as a pilot. About 1926, Lindbergh had learned that a gentleman in New York was offering $25,000 for the first person or crew of people who could fly an airplane nonstop between New York City and Paris, France. Lindbergh's main philosophy for the flight was having enough gasoline to go the distance. And so it all came down to the issue of weight and balancing the science of flight with the actual supplies that you need to make it. He rounded up a group of St. Louis businessmen who were interested in aviation, and they agreed to build him an airplane. Charles left New York, Roosevelt Field, on the morning of May 20th, 1927, just before eight o'clock. Not ideal conditions. It had been raining for about the past week. The runway was made out of dirt, so it was very soggy and very challenging, and he just cleared the telephone lines at the end of the runway by about 20 feet. 3,600 miles to Paris. Once he left North Canada, Newfoundland coastline, nobody had heard from him. He didn't have a radio over the ocean. The technology wasn't advanced enough to be able to carry a signal that far. Over Nova Scotia, rain lashed the wings, seeped into the cockpit. The wind took the plane in its teeth and shook it as a dog shakes a rabbit. He had carefully mapped out his route using a system called Dead Reckoning, which is a navigation system before GPS. And he had to rely on a sense of timing as well as his compass and carefully make those turns and adjustments each hour to stay on course. But even with all of his detours around the storms, uh, miraculously, he was only three miles off course when he hit the coast of Ireland. He worked his way down the England coast and landed in Paris after 33 and a half hours in the air. He was an instant celebrity. After the flight, he was hired by the Guggenheim Foundation to do a goodwill tour of the United States. Flew in with the spirit of St. Louis, gave a speech, and uh, just helped really promote that aviation was something that was safe, it was something that we needed as a nation. And he helped scout out locations for airports and what kind of technology needed to be at those airports and really helped establish our system as we know it today. He also did some dabbling in science, uh, working with Dr. Alexis Carell in the early 30s. Charles really looked at the human body as a machine. And if you could replace a bad part on a tractor, why can't you replace a bad part in a human being? And so he started talking with Carell about organ transplant and where that was, and really helped them redesign the perfusion pump, which is a device to help keep organs alive outside of the human body, which is that first step needed in order to, to have a heart transplant. In 1927, after Lindbergh made his famous flight, there was a big rally in the community to 
to preserve this house. The family donated the 110 acre farm with the house to the state of Minnesota in 1931 for that purpose. In 1954, after his mother's death, Charles went through all of her possessions and started sorting things out. Anything that pertained to here in, on the farm in Minnesota came to the Minnesota Historical Society. And so when you walk through the house today, it looks very much like it did in the 19-teens. Just that feel of walking into the past and what Charles's life must have been like as a youth. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. But as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.